Abby here by SpiritualCrusade.com and we are so excited you guys are here with us again this week. So today we are doing Revelations 12 through 22. Now, you guys, I love, love this half of Revelation and I really, really hope that if you guys have not already fallen in love with Revelations, that by the end of today, you guys will have fallen in love with it. I really am hoping for that. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> so first of all, this half of the Revelation kind of outlines the basic plan of salvation. You guys, we're going to see pre-mortal earth, um, pre-mortal life with the war in heaven. We're obviously going to talk a lot about life on earth. And we're going to have glimpses into what the afterlife will look like for both the wicked and the righteous, which I am sure was very helpful for the righteous who are receiving the letter at the time John wrote it. Um, and we're going to... he. He talks about um, resurrection, judgment, and even the earth being celestialized at the end. So, I mean, we hit all these beautiful points on the plan of salvation. And I am sure that this letter was written as a letter of hope for the saints. Because if you guys remember from last week when we talked about it, they were receiving intense persecution at the, at the time. And, um, and they were a small group of people. So they were the minority and they were being fought against, killed and persecuted. I mean, it was not pretty. And here they're receiving this letter that clearly outlines what life's going to look like for the righteous after this life. And I'm sure that just gave them so much hope. So much hope, you guys. Um, plus, there is this end aligning message throughout the whole thing that the kingdom of God will conquer the kingdom of the devil. And like I said, when you're in a minority and you're being killed off, you think the war's about to end like we've lost. Right? Like, I'm sure they were very overwhelmed with, is this, is, is, is this going to, like, continue? I mean, what is this going to, what's going to happen, right? I'm sure they were very scared and confused. And then he comes out with this letter, which, which I said, which what I've already, wow, I can't talk. Let me try it again. <laughs> I've kind of lost my voice because I was sick last week. So you just have to bear with me because I got to sound a little, a little, a little rough. Um. But I am sure the saints really needed that message that it doesn't matter how small they are. It doesn't matter how hard Satan attacks. None of it matters. The church and kingdom of God will win in the end. Jesus Christ will come in on his beautiful white horse and everything's going to be okay. Like I'm sure they needed this message so bad that the kingdom of God will prevail. It will conquer. Um, so I'm sure that was a beautiful message for them. And then the last one is the title of this week's Come Follow Me. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And once again, that's part of that glimpse into the eternities, that glimpse into what's coming for them that I'm sure gave them so much, so much hope. Now, when we read this, we might look at all the beasts and the, the persecution and the wickedness, and it can get kind of scary. But for them, they were already living that. They already were being attacked on every side. They were already, they had their beasts per se. You know what I mean? Like they already had the scary in their midst. So they would get, get out of this book, hope and glory, glory to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, cause like I said, he's going to come in at the end and conquer and win the day. So this would have been a letter of joy and hope to the saints. And I want you and I to take away that same message. If at all possible, I want us to just kind of push through the scary and to see the beautiful message that the saints at the time that John writ, writ, wrote this would have received it as. So that's the first thing I wanted. So that's kind of what I, how I wanted to introduce this today. Um, now, we are going to start in chapter 12 with the, well, before we get into the pre-mortal and the war in heaven, he's going to start us with a little story, okay? And we're going to see a woman, and she's pregnant. Now, the woman represents the church of God, and her child represents the kingdom of God with Christ as the king, okay? Now, for the sake of making my life easy, we're just going to call the woman the church and kingdom of God. <laughs> I'm just going to combine the two. So, he sees this red dragon, and this red dragon hates the church and kingdom of God. This red dragon hates this woman and will do anything to take her down. Okay. Now we're going to see in five and six, it's going to talk about the woman fleeing into the wilderness. And that is what happened was when Christ 
started his ministry, he started to organize the kingdom of God. He, he began to really organize what that, that true kingdom of God, right? But then when he was killed off, when the apostles were ki killed off, the work of the kingdom of God kind of went on, just stopped for a moment, right? It's still there, but that's kind of representative of her fleeing into the wilderness. Just kind of put on hold for just a second, right? And then it rolled forth again when the prophet Joseph Smith restored the gospel. So we're going to see how it's just going to get on, on get put on hold as she flees into the wilderness in 5 and 6. And then in 7, we begin to see this war in heaven where Michael and the angels are fighting against um, Satan and this dragon, okay, this red dragon. Now, of course, they're going to win and they're going to cast Satan out. But what I really want to make note of is how they won. It's incredibly important. So we're going to jump down to 11. Now, this is Craig's ponderized scripture for this week. Okay, so we've talked about it in the past. If you guys haven't already, go and find his ponderized scripture. Go to spiritualcrusade.com, find his ponderized scripture, read the posts. And also, I really want to encourage you guys to find Sherry's, her challenge. Um, she does a scriptural challenge every single week, a come follow me challenge, where she takes different scriptures and she tries to come up with a really fun challenge. I really would encourage you guys to go and check out both of those. So let's read this. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So basically they overcame the dragon the same way we overcome him today. They overcame him by the atonement of Jesus Christ and through their faith and testimony and their love of their savior. So it's pretty remarkable to think of how they overcame him then is the same way we overcome him today. Okay, you guys, so now Satan realizes he's being cast down to that earth. <laughs> he's in 13. He sees that he's, he's cast down on this earth, and he is not happy with this woman. So then we're going to see him throw everything he can at her. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it all means, but he, you can just feel that he's like, I will throw everything I can at you to stop you, but he cannot stop. Stop her. He cannot stop the work of the Lord. And I just want to read it to you um, in Joseph Smith's words in the standard of truth. Because there is nothing he can do to stop this great work. No one hallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecu persecution may rage. Mobs may combine. Armies may assemble. Calmly made a fame. But the truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear, till the purpose of God shall be accomplished, and the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. So there's absolutely nothing Satan can throw at the work of God to stop it. It will continue to roll forth. Now, the very last verse of that chapter, um, we see that he is now going to go after the remnant, the remnant of the seed of the woman. Who's the remnant? We are. We are the faithful saints, the faithful followers of Jesus Christ are the remnant. So he continues that battle against us. And you guys, that battle, we're going to see it in full, you know, whatever. It's really going to be seen very, very clearly in the next couple chapters, okay? We're going to start by introducing to you a couple of Satan's key players. Um, so we're gonna, in chapter 13, we're going to see two beasts, okay? One is going to be a political beast with political pipe type power, and the other is going to be a counterfeit spiritual type beast, okay? Um, in chapter, in 19, let's see, in 1920, when, um, in 1920 it says, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. So you're gonna see that with that second beast. That second beast is going to work miracles and wonders, and they're just gonna astonish the world, okay? And he is going to deceive the world with his wonders. He's gonna be this false prophet. So I guess I don't even have to do this. He is a false prophet, <laughs> but he is going to deceive many um, with his wonders and miracles. So we cannot be deceived. We need to remember what the prophet, um, Russell Nelson has said about our time in our day and age. He has said, But in the coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. We cannot afford to be deceived. We have got to be on top of our game, you guys. Okay, so there's a lot with these two beasts. We're not going to go into all the details and everything, but I'm going to jump. We're going to jump, and I'm going to introduce you to the third kind of key player in the in um, 
Satan's game, okay? And that's going to be in 17. Let's jump over to 17 and see this third key player. So we've got these two beasts. And then we're going to have, in 17, we're introduced to the whore of all the earth. And this is a, this woman is represented as, um, I mean, she is pretty much the wickedness of the earth, if you guys really think about it. Because, you know, you got the political beast and you got the, the, the counterfeit spiritual beast. He's not spiritual. He's of the devil. Um, but um, playing that card, making him, people think that he is. And then you've got the, this woman, the whore of all the earth, is just the wickedness. And it's just, it's everywhere. It's rampant, okay? The wickedness of the, of the earth. And it's going to describe her a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to tell you guys, in my opinion, one of the funnest ways to study um, this part, her, <laughs> the whore of all the earth, is to, to um, study her alongside what you learn in the Book of Mormon, in um, 1 Nephi 14. So, the thing, so Nephi had a very similar vision, and this was about 600 years before Christ was born. And he recorded his vision, and he wasn't allowed to record all of it because he was told that one of the 12, John, we're reading right here, was actually in charge of telling the rest of it. So we don't actually learn everything that Nephi knows, but he does teach us a little bit about this, um, this woman. And so it's really fun to take what you learn from the Book of Mormon and what you learn from the Bible and to cross-reference and to just kind of see how beautifully they go hand in hand. So let's start in verse 13 of First Nephi 14. And it came to pass that I beheld that the great mother of abominations, the same, the whore of the earth, that's another one of her title, great mother of abominations, did gather together multitudes upon the face of all the earth among all the nations of the Gentiles to fight against the Lamb of God. Now you're going to see that again. You're going to see that in the Bible in verse, um, in chapter 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now that word admiration, if you look at the footnote, is astonishment and wonder. So here's a woman who is going, this, the wickedness um, is just so bad. And pretty much anybody who falls into the category of against God falls under her category because she's kind of called the church of the devil, um, whether it's an, a, a church entity or if it's just his, him, anything that fights against the church of God is pretty much um, part of her. So all the wickedness, all the abomination of the world, all of that is going to fight against the saints. And then this really cool part, and we're going to read one from the Book of Mormon and one from the Bible to see how cool this is, you guys. So, the first one I'm going to do from the Book of Mormon in verse 14. And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth. So he sees the covenant people scattered all over the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. You guys, if that doesn't just stir up this like emotion inside of you, I don't know what will. So he sees that the Lamb of God descends upon the saints and arms them with power and great glory. Let's see it again in um, chapter 17, verse 14 of Revelation. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Isn't that so good? So when you combine these two wonderful scriptures, both written by prophets, both given these incredible visions, and when you read them together, you can learn so much more. And it's just so powerful, you guys, that, that the wickedness of the world will try really hard to attack um, the saints of God, but we will be armed with power and great glory and armed with righteousness. And here it says, and the lamb shall overcome for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Isn't that so beautiful? Oh my goodness, you guys. Okay, so those are the three kind of players in the game and none of them have any anything against our Lord and Savior, nothing. Okay, let's go back. We're gonna jump into, um, back to chapter 14. And here we're going to see some real opposites. 
we're gonna see some stark opposites, some differences, okay? So, in chapter 13, we learned about those who receive the mark of the beast are either marked in their palms of their hands or their foreheads. And then we're gonna see an exact opposite to the 144,000 who follow Jesus Christ. And they will have the name of their father on their forehead, the name of God, which is so beautiful to see that stark opposite. Like Satan tries to counterfeit with his marks, but they can't. They're, it's just an it's just completely opposite here. So um, now just a note with the 144,000, we do not in any way, shape or form believe that that's the only people who will be exalted or you know, saved in the end. But it is important to note that they do have a key role in the latter days. All the details of that, that role, I don't know and understand, but they do have a key role in, um, in the last days. Um, okay. So that's kind of, that's one of God's key players, the 144,000. <laughs> it's a lot of key players. Okay. And they have that sealed their the name of their God sealed on their forehead. Now we're going to see some more opposites. Um, we are going to jump into, we're going to see in 10 verses 9, 10, and 11 is what um, the wicked have to look forward to when they die. <laughs> um, so we're just going to read one of those. Let's see here. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and that and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So the their torment is endless. Okay, that was in verse 11. Now, let's go on and see the exact opposite, which is one of the things that I really feel like gave them so much hope back when they were receiving this is just these stark opposites for them to be able to clearly see you will triumph. And if you die... As a believer in Jesus Christ, if they kill you, don't worry, because the other side has got glory for you, right? Like, you will be rewarded. So 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And that's so beautiful. So there was a complete opposite there from the one, um, the, the, um, in 11, there was no rest day or night. And in 13, and they may receive rest from their labors. So once again, seeing that, that opposite. And then we're going to see it again in 14 through 16, we're going to see the harvest of gathering the righteous out from among the wicked. And then in 17 through 20, you're going to see what's going to happen to the wicked that remain. Once again, seeing those opposites. And then again in 15, we're going to see this beautiful scene that he sees for the saints. Those that have overcome the beast is in 15 too. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. The sea of glass is the celestial earth. And they're just singing and praising and glorifying. It's so beautiful. Um, as opposed to the wicked, <laughs> which we're going to see what's going to happen to those who have the mark of the beast in chapter 16. We're going to see again that opposite from standing on this celestial, or celestialized earth and singing and praising to those who are in the... Um, non-celestialized earth what do i just the made just the earth and what they ha what they're going to receive okay now these seven plagues that you're going to see in chapter 16 are very similar to the ones we saw in chapter 8 but these are specialized for the wicked so you're going to see more words that are more specialized for the wicked that you did not see in chapter 8 for example, in the very first one, in two, we're going to see an, a sore fall upon those that had the mark of the beast. That sore is not even mentioned in the first, in chapter eight. So these are going to be a little bit more specialized. Um, so I don't know if specialized is the right word, but this, the, the seven upon the wicked, the seven plagues upon the wicked. 
All right, we already talked about 17. That's what we talk about, the whore of all the earth. 18 is the fall of Babylon. Now, Babylon, it, the whore is definitely represented there. I mean, she's, she is Babylon. I mean, Babylon is one of her titles in verse, fi in verse 5. I mean, she's everywhere. She's not just one city, but she's definitely represented there, and she's going to fall hard, okay? The fall of this city, Babylon, is going to be hard, and it's beautiful to read. But I just want to read verse 4 to give us all a little bit of hope before this great city falls, okay? Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. I don't know about you, but I'm sure that that gives it gives me so much peace. I'm sure it gave the saints then peace, and I'm sure it gives you guys all peace that at some point in this great city, the saints are going to be called out. You know, they're going to say, come out. Come out from Babylon. Now, every time you hear Babylon, it means wickedness. So if you hear in the scriptures, you know, flee Babylon, flee wickedness, um, or hear come out from Babylon, it literally is, this city is literally about to fall in verse 18. But, we're, but the saints get called out before it falls. So that's really awesome. Okay, you guys, that was a lot. That was the first half, and that was a lot. So now we get into kind of the second half of the plan of salvation part. Um, well, I mean, it's not, the plan of salvation isn't like as clearly, it's just little pieces here and there, but it's really cool to see this beautiful plan unravel. So, in chapter 19, we've got the marriage supper. So who is the bride? The bride is the church of the Lamb, okay? And it's so beautiful. Every time you see reference to the bride being made ready, it's the church being made ready um, for our bridegroom, who is our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's really pretty, pretty cool. Now, in the very in 19, you're going to see two suppers, okay? The first is the supper being prepared for the bride and bridegroom, which is the church and her king. And... The next supper <laughs> is the supper that the wicked actually become the supper. So you do not want to be invited to that supper. <laughs> um, in 17 and 19, the, the animals of the air, <laughs> the birds, are invited to um, eat the flesh of the kings and the, the wicked, basically. So don't be invited to that supper because that means you are the supper. So we definitely want to be a part of the other one. We want to go to the bridegroom and the bride supper. <laughs> Um, okay, and then in verse, at the end, um, we're going to see that beautiful picture of the Savior on that white horse, and he is going to defeat the beasts. Um, we already read it earlier, where it says the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet who wrought the miracles, and they are going to be put into a fire of burning and brimstone, okay? So, and then in the next verse, it talks about, and the remnant was slain, with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes in on his horse and destroys the beasts. And that is the end of their story. So in 20, verses 1 through 3, you're going to see Satan is bound. 4 through 6, we're going to talk about, he's going to talk about the resurrection. And then 7 through 10. This is the last battle between good and evil. And here you're going to see Satan's going to gather his people and they're going to surround the saints. And I am pretty sure that they probably thought that they had, had their final moment of glory. Okay. The way that it just, the, let's just read it and you're going to see it in your mind. And they went up on the breath of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints round about the beloved city. So they've encircled them, okay? Like I said, they probably are thinking, we've got the upper hand, <laughs> we have got them completely surrounded and outnumbered, okay? And then fire comes down from out of heaven and devours them. And then the, the devil and his angels are cast into the lake of fire and, and brimstone. So that's our great and last battle um, at the end of the millennium. Because at the beginning of the millennium, one through six, Satan was bound, then that's the end of the millennium. And we have final judgment is about 11 through the end of that chapter. And then 21 has so many beautiful verses, you guys. So many beautiful verses about the with the Lord claiming us and just letting us know that he is our Lord and our God. 
Let's just read some of them, starting at three. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Once again, claiming us. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe, wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In 6 and 7 he says, it is, and it says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So I don't know about you guys, but when I read those, I just feel I'm filled with so much love for our Savior. And I just love how he's going to just claim us, and he's just going to say, Come, come, I will be your God, and I will wipe away all your tears. One more verse from chapter 22. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, whosoever let him take the water of life freely. So there is the invitation to come. Come to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You guys, I hope that you loved these chapters as much as I did. It is so beautiful the way that he, he just wrote it out for them in such a way that they could feel hope. They could see the dark, the drastic contrast between light and darkness, righteousness and wickedness. You can see that the Lamb of God will overcome and that it, those of us who are persecuted or those of them that were persecuted, that we can overcome and receive all things in the end. And so really, it really this really is a book of hope. Hope and a beautiful testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as King and King and Lord of Lords. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I hope you guys have joined me next year for our Book of Mormon study. See you later.